Well, I would like to preach from Philippians chapter 3 because that song we just sang is based on it. Sorry I didn't get the communication right. We're going to preach from John chapter 3 this morning, the new birth, because the series on the will of God. We've been in that, knowing the will of God. How can we know the will of God? And most of the time we want to know the will of God so that we don't do the wrong thing. I want to do the right thing. And knowing the will of God is not something that God wants to show us so that we'll know what we should do. The will of God is what he wants to do. That's his will. His will, first he says it, then he does it because he is faithful. And uh, the will of God is a revelation of what he desires to do in you, with you, through you, and as you, before the Father and the watching world around you, for his glory and your joy and strength. And his revelation of his will is an invitation. It's an invitation for you to join him by faith, believing that what he has said he will do because he is faith, faithful. And, of course, the new birth in John chapter 3 is based upon the scripture that says over and over and over, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And uh, uh, 1 Timothy 2, God desires that all men be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Being saved means knowing someone, Jesus Christ. Salvation is a person, Jesus Christ, and a personal relationship with him. And so, of course, the classic chapter in this is John chapter 3. And uh, uh, the chapter on the new birth and the story of Jesus and how Nicodemus, the teacher in Israel, Jesus called him the teacher of Israel. In other words, the teachers of Israel learned from Nicodemus. He was the teacher of all of the rabbis. And he came to Jesus at night. Follow along. I just want to read the first uh, 16 verses. And, of course, I want to ask you to join me on verse 16 because that was the first verse that I memorized. I know for many of you it was as well. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things, uh, the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, uh, answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who come, came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Well, the context of that 
memory verse that we all started out with is that setting of Jesus explaining the necessity of the new birth, the spiritual birth. And uh, his, his questioning to the leading teacher of Israel, the teacher of the rabbis was, how can you not know these things? And because unless you are born again, or the, the Greek word is born from above, the spiritual birth is a birth from above. That was Jesus' reference to the one who is in heaven who has come down. He's come down to bring the opportunity for that. The, oper the invitation to that is from above and the new birth. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born a second time? Jesus said, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. That which is born of the water is flesh. That's the fleshly birth. That's the natural birth. It's water uh, from start to finish. But the spiritual birth, is from above. That's the second birth. That's the new birth. And by the Holy Spirit it happens. The Holy Spirit. And you can't go to the Holy Spirit like the wind, Nicodemus. You can't go to the wind. The wind finds you. Amen. The Holy Spirit comes to you with the invitation. And, and, uh, and this is God's initiative from start to finish. Uh, the, the, the new birth. And, and Nicodemus was trying to understand. And so Jesus just made it very clear with that great verse. This is the way that God loved the world. I, I love that the way it is in Spanish because it makes it very clear uh, that this is the way. Porque tanto uh, manera amó Dios el mundo. Everardo, did I get it right? This is the manner in which, this is the way, this is the way that God loved the world. How? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish. There's the promise of God. What God has said, he will do because he is faithful. But do you believe it? That's the question. Will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And Jesus used a story illustrating this from uh, something that uh, from the book of Numbers that, uh, that Nicodemus was very familiar with. When the children of Israel sinned in the wilderness, one of the many, many times, it was toward the end of their wilderness wandering, long about year 39, <laughs> and uh, they were rebellion, but rebellious again. Some of that original generation that came out, those with hard hearts, unbelief, were still alive. And God sent it says fiery serpents into their camp. It was actually a fiery bite, and it was deadly. Anyone that, uh, that, that got bitten died, and it was one of the plagues, and, and they were dying, and they cried out uh, to be saved, and God told Moses to do one of the strangest things. That's why the rabbis had a hard time with this one. Make an image of a serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up. God had said, don't make a graven image, but that was to worship. Why did God tell Moses to make an image of a serpent? Because the serpent was a reminder of their sin. It wasn't something to be worshipped. It was a reminder and a confession of sin. And God told Moses, whoever looks will not die. They will be saved. And that's what he did. And those who were bitten, they looked because they believed and they did not die. And of course, my version of this uh, scene is not in the Bible, but I can picture it. Somebody all of a sudden coming out and saying, oh no, I've been bitten, I've been bitten. And the tent next to him running out and say, well, look, look, look at the serpent on the stick and you will not die. And the man saying, how do you know? And him saying, because I was bitten and I looked and I did not die. Well, Jesus used that illustration, but the clearest picture, John 3, 16. And that lets us know that we've got a deadly, deadly problem. You know, sin doesn't make a person bad. It makes a person dead. 
And the gospel doesn't make a person good. It makes a person alive. And that's what the Bible teaches. And alive because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Lifted up three times in John's gospel. He records that Jesus saying, be, that I be lifted up. The Son of Man will be lifted up, he said in chapter 3. The Son of Man be lifted up in chapter 8 and in chapter 12. That... Uh, uh, that, that, that he promised that he would draw, if, if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. And so salvation, salvation is looking, looking to Jesus Christ because of the reality of sin in our lives. That comes first. It's bad news before it's good news. That we are dead in our sin. And, and but, but God sent his son Jesus Christ to, Pay the penalty by dying on the cross, not just for our sins, not just for mine and not for, just for yours, but for the whole world. That whoever looks to him for salvation, for relationship with him, for relationship with God. And I know some of us were kind of influenced by uh, preaching. I can't really criticize anybody's preaching as, <laughs> as many times as Beth can tell you I messed up. <laughs> But I know that under some preaching, we, we were told, no, if you, you, I remember hearing one man say that the RA camp had all the boys there about eight years old, and they're at the bonfire. And here's what his message, do you want to end up there? <laughs> <laughs> and he said that over and over and over. <laughs> this man, grown man, told me, that, he said, do you want to end up there? Or you want to end up where we're going back here in a minute in the air conditioning? Well... Slack of the wall. Sure don't want to jump in the bonfire. <laughs> Give me the air conditioning for sure. Beloved, that's not what it means to be saved. What it means to be saved is this. You get to know God through Jesus Christ who gave his life in your place. That kind of love and long-suffering, how he has put up with us. Long-suffering. For so long, when did it all begin for you? You know, for some of us, we grew up in Sunday school and church. I, we, I thought that was one word until I learned that you had early service, and then Sunday school, and then church. We did Sunday school and church. We went. Both my parents grew up in a Christian home. Both sets of grandparents grew up in Christian home. All sets of great-grandparents grew up in Christians' home. And yet, you know, you can still rebel against that. But I had a great heritage of uh, going to Sunday school in church, and so I don't even remember the first time I went. Uh, Wednesday nights, we were there, and uh, that was just our life. And as a six-year-old boy at Trinity Baptist Church in San Antonio, Buckner Fanning had just arrived on the scene in 1959. And I was seeing a lot of people get baptized, just like we saw Leslie this morning. I mean, we were baptizing people Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night even, because so many people were coming to Christ. And we had the Lord's Supper regularly too. So I was watching that. I knew I hadn't gotten baptized. I wanted to be. And every time we'd have the Lord's Supper, it seemed like that was just my size, little cracker, little cup, you know. This is made for children. No, my dad, Dick Stahl, he wouldn't let me get that cracker or that cup. And he would explain to me, he said, this is for people who are saved and have been baptized. And you haven't been yet. You will, but not yet. And just sit tight. Don't make any noise. I'll break off a little piece of cracker and give it to you if you're good. So I would be real quiet. I'd watch him. Of course, he'd hold that cracker and he'd be praying till everybody. And then when it came time to eat that cracker, I'd keep my eye on him. He'd open one eye. He'd break off a little corner and he'd give it to me. <laughs> and I would eat. Then as that cup was going around, he would explain to me, he'd share with me his faith. I came to know Christ as a boy, and, and I was baptized there in Kingsville. And, and, uh, 
Don't, you can't have a cup, but I'll save a little drop for you. Okay, so he'd hold that cup. He'd be praying. I'd be watching him. It came time to drink that cup. He'd open one eye, smile. <laughs> he'd start to drink. I'd watch him, and he'd wait and have a little bit, and then he'd give me the rest. I'd drink that. <laughs> well, I knew the story very well about Jesus, and I wanted to be baptized. And I've talked to my parents so many times about it, but one Sunday night on the way home from church, I was just a few months shy of seven. I told my dad, Dick Stahl, again, I wanted to be saved. I wanted to be baptized so I could have the Lord's Supper too. And Daddy started talking about it again. And I remember standing there, because I was standing up in the seat next to him. <laughs> Think about those days. And uh, as he began to tell John 3.16, how God so loved the world, God sent his own son. And I remember thinking, I already know this story. I know how it ends, but I'm going to listen. And as he was sharing the gospel again with me, he had many, many times. This time was different because what came into my mind's eye was a Sunday school poster of Jesus on the cross dark background a sunbeam shining on him the crowd all around with different expressions and a roman soldier standing there looking up at him with his hand outstretched that's what came to my mind it was a poster in sunday school i actually found it in a revival at gunsight baptist church outside of breckenridge many years ago it's my screensaver today an old Sunday school poster came to mind. There was Jesus dying on the cross. But that Sunday night, it was different. I, I knew that he died on the cross for the whole world. And I can't really describe how I knew, except to now know it was a revelation of the Holy Spirit. It didn't matter that Jesus died on the cross for the world. At that moment on the way home from church, I knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. And that's when Jesus Christ became personal, a personal Savior. And I certainly knew what sin was at the time. <laughs> By then, uh, that would, didn't have to be explained. I knew exactly what that was and the, the difficulty of that. But that's when I knew and believed that Jesus Christ came and did what he did for me. Now, the reason I know that is because during in, in Houston, in high school, junior high and high school, the startup of the Jesus movement in the late 60s, early 70s, we went in, as a junior high group to youth rallies. The First Baptist of Houston would have, <laughs> seemed like nightly, but every weekend, as a part of what God was doing in the nation during those days. Some of you uh, take, took part of that. Some of you remember. We went down, and, and, and I would go forward every single service. And we went, seemed like weekly. The counselors knew my first name. I mean, <laughs> here he comes again. And so, all, you know, I would say, I, I want to rededicate my life. And so after several rededication some of the counselors said are you sure you're saved i said well talk to me about it and with good counseling when was the first time that jesus really became real personal to you not your parents savior you and so remembering i was as far back as i can reach to that event of when i can say i was saved when i looked at jesus on the cross as my personal Savior. Now, as a six-year-old boy, I didn't know any theology, but I can say I knew Jesus. At that moment, I believe now, having studied theology, I went from a dead boy to an alive boy. I was born from above, and now a whole 61 years later, I feel like I haven't even learned to walk yet, but I'm learning. 
We are beginners, and that's all we'll ever be, in learning, knowing Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. And I invite you to know him today. We've sung about him. Thank you for singing my favorite songs every Sunday, Gary, <laughs> especially today. We've, been, we've sung about him. We've heard from the Bible of him. As Paul uses accounting terms, loss, gain, count, that's bottom line. Everything I counted gain, all of my religion, all. You know, Paul didn't repent of bad stuff. Paul repented of good stuff. All that I had on my resume that gave me credentials, he said everything I thought was gain, now has moved over to the lost column. I counted loss for the sake of Christ to be uh, found in him, to gain, uh, to be counted uh, as the bottom line, there's only one thing that I count, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. But I wonder about you. Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Have you responded to the invitation of God's will for you? And we learned last Sunday, Jesus, Jesus is the one who will keep you in the will of God. You don't have to ask and say, well, I don't want to get out of the will of God. Jesus makes sure that you will not get out of his will. He promised that. He who is given to him, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast out. The one who hungers and thirsts for him, for revival, for righteousness. I invite you to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Come into the kingdom. Not only see it, but enter it. First you see it by faith. Then you enter it by faith. And then he keeps you there by faith. Believing that what God has said, he will do. Because he is faithful. And he who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. Or as a believer, learning to walk, learning to talk like the rest of us. But like all of us too, having wandered. Oh, it was good. Uh, the, but I, before I was afflicted, I uh, went astray. But now I keep your wor word. It is good that I was afflicted. That I might learn your statutes difficulty that you've had by wandering listen beloved hear the invitation to come back as soon as you turn around and repent from wandering you come face to face with Jesus Christ you may have left him but he never left you and you never lost your relationship with him maybe fellowship but not relationship because he keeps us maybe you would come back today or maybe you would come as a believer to join this church, to make a commitment here in this church. It's revival. And that means being alive more and more and more because of what God is saying we're hearing, because of what God is doing we're seeing, and we're joining him in all that is happening around the world. I invite you to come and with your faith in Jesus Christ. Come. Come to Christ. Amen. And let's stand and bow our heads together.